Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's video. I'm Pastor Matt, this is Pastor Adrian, and we pray this message blesses you and encourages you all throughout your week. Absolutely. For any more information on how to be praying with us or to become a part of our community or to give, please head on over to takeovergr.com. Good morning, church. Go ahead and make your way to your seats as we get started. Uh, well, welcome. My name is Pastor Evan, and I've got a, um, a quick few things about uh, our church's vision. Uh, now, our church vision is to see Jesus take over people's lives. Um, and so what are we doing about that? That's, that's both to see other people's uh, lives be brought into and, and under Jesus and to, to know him intimately, deeply, and have their lives fully taken over, but also for ourselves. Uh, so here's a few things that we're doing this month, the month of January, uh, the first month of the year, to, to posture and position ourselves to that end. Um, so to start, um, uh, every Wednesday for this month, we're having glory nights, uh, just positioning our, we're not doing boys crew or babes crew or like any other small groups. We're gathering together to worship and to give God glory, to set up this year uh, in the right posture of just praising him, glorifying him, and, and his presence just saturating this place as we go into the first year. So that's on Wednesday, 7 o'clock. Friday morning, we still have our prayer meeting, 6 a.m. Be here. They are so good. Um, and if you can't make it in person, you can catch it online in the mornings on the live stream or the restream. Um, as well, uh, we have our fire fast, and so uh, Pastor Matt's got a uh, video on YouTube explaining this more, but it is, it is a food fast, a fast that we're doing corporately as a church to posture our hearts, to lean in and to give God our first fruits. Now, so our first fruits, um, this is uh, first fruits month, a lot, of, a lot of churches have end of the year giving. Um, we, that's, that's great, but we're not doing it as a bottom line to reach a certain tax bracket or anything like that. We, we want to posture ourselves to give God our first of the year, to set ourselves up as a church well for the year, but to set ourselves up personally, spiritually well, to say, Lord, this is, this is what I'm, I am, I am setting aside and what I'm going to give. And so at the end of this month, we have a first fruits donation that we're leaning into. And so taking time through this, through, through these glory nights, through worship, through prayer through fasting to consider, Lord, what are you asking of me? How can I give more and receive more from you to, to be in a intimate, more intimate relationship with you? Um, so that's what we're doing for this this first month. It's it's like whew, full force. It's exhausting. I am lacking food and I'm <laughs> God is going gonna to pull through. I'm, I'm, I know he will. But um, uh, with that, let's uh, let's head into prayer. Um, feel free to stand um, as, as we pray and get ready to worship. Our Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this month. Thank you for another year. Thank you for a year that we get to, to learn and to grow, to come into you and into your spirit. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you come, rest in this place. Rest on these people, Father. Meet us. Reveal yourself to us today, Lord, through, through the worship, through the word spoken. Through the message, Father, we are here, and may you be may you be glorified, and may you be praised, Lord. It's in your Son's precious name we pray. Amen.
I've seen, I know there's a lot of new people um, in the place this morning. Um, and I would just like to offer out an extension of freedom in this place. I don't know, you know, how you worshiped growing up or, you know, the church that you normally attend or wherever you go. I don't know what it's like for you when you worship there. Um, when we are in this place, you know, if you're new here, I just want you to know that this is a place where if you got to come down here and fall on your face and cry before the Lord during worship, come do it. Okay, if you got to spread out, if you got to dance around, um, you know, we, we've had we've had people waving flags in here. We, we have people running around. I mean, whatever you have to do, this this moment of worship, I mean, this is, it, it, fill, it fills us up, it renews our souls, but this is an outpouring to the Lord, just showing Him how much we love Him. Um, so I would just, I would encourage all of us in this moment, just pour that love back out on him that he has shown to us. If you got to spread out, if you got to get away from your neighbor or your family, whatever you got to do, um, do that in this moment. There, there's no rules here. You don't have to stay in your seat. Whatever you got to do, just do it. Worship, fall on your face before the Lord and just, we're just singing, I love you, I love you, I love you. Just, let's just pour that love back out on him, guys.
prepare. Let's sing, I'll prepare. that I want for my life and I want for your lives as well. Let's sing amen one more time. As we pray amen, it means let it be so. A thousand times over, let it be so. Jesus, as we pray this morning, God, as we seek you, Lord, I know that there are people who are coming to this place and you have been the only thing holding them together this week. Jesus, just singing those songs that you're a lamp to our feet. You're the honey on our lips. You are the water that we are desperately seeking and thirsty for, God. In this place, this morning, it's primed, the scene has been set, you are doing a new thing amid your people, God. Thank you. Amen, amen, amen. This morning as we're worshiping, as we're praying, there are people who this week, the, the only thing holding you together is Jesus. And, and some of you came forward during worship you're coming forward to the altar and you're praying and you're believing. And if that's you this morning, if you need freedom, if you're, you're making room for him, if you're making room this morning, I want you to come up here to the front, be brave. I'm going to pray over you. I'm up front too. Just come forward. Everybody else, bow your heads. Let's give some privacy. Just come forward today. Don't leave this place burdened with anxiety, depression, doubt, addiction, infirmity in your body. Do not leave this place today. Come forward. Come forward. 
There is no shame in this place if the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you and he's moving for you to come forward. Come forward today. If our staff can come up behind everyone, just extend a hand towards the front as we pray this morning. Be brave. Jesus, I speak over sing every single person here this morning, God. Every single person willing to come up front and receive the prayer that they so desperately need. Feel that hand and know that you are not alone. You are not alone. Every person in this room is touched by hurt, brokenness, infirmity of some kind, and God is calling you out of that place. He's telling you to make room. He's telling you to come away. He's telling you to seek him, to know him, to find him, to let let him breathe new life over your marriage, new life over your identity, new life over where depression is its claws. He's reminding you have teeth in your mouth that are for rending the flesh of the devil. And he is here to remind you this morning, you are a child of God. You are a child of God. You're not a child of addiction. You're not a child of pornography. You're not a child of, of brokenness inherited by generational curses within your family. You are not a child of poverty. You are not a child of illness and sickness. In Jesus' mighty name, freedom. Make room. Make room. Make room. Make room this morning. Father God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for moving. Put your hands open in front of you to receive. This morning, he has a gift for you. He has a gift for you, and it's that freedom. It is that freedom. Let him into that part of of your heart that is so broken, where you have been deceived that that is all that this world has for you. It is not. God has so much more. He's speaking new life. He's breathing over you this morning. He's breathing over you this morning. He's breathing over you this morning. Do you hear his voice? Do you hear what he's telling you? Do you hear what he's telling you this morning? He's whispering in that still quiet voice. He loves you. He loves you so much. He went and he died on that cross and he would do it again in a heartbeat for you. For you, he would do it again. There is freedom. There is freedom. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All over this room, thank you, Jesus. 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 God, thank you for moving in this place, Lord. As we continue to pray for our brothers and sisters within our community, God. We're asking for covering protection, protection on the leadership and the body of takeover. Father God, we, we need an extra portion of your spirit and your truth. We want protection over our people, Lord. Protection, protection. Break the plans of the enemy in Jesus' mighty name. God, we're praying for our community for our hearts to be burdened as your heart is burdened, God, for our roots to go deep. Jesus, for us to dwell in your presence in that quiet place, Lord. We want more of you. Jesus, we're praying for financial provision, God, for you to move powerfully. We trust you, Jesus. We trust you, Jesus. God, we're lifting up someone, a family who lost a loved one, a sister, 19 years old. Unspeakable, unspeakable loss, God. Move, Jesus, move powerfully, God. They need you so badly. We need you so badly. Jesus, healing, continued healing for an aunt and an uncle. God, we're praying. We're praying for another grandmother that needs healing as well. Jesus, move powerfully. It's by your stripes that we have been healed. We believe it. Give us the faith. Give us the strength to put our faith in you because so many of us are putting it in something else, God. Praying for a sister-in-law who's been going to the ER right now with pain in her body. God, move, Jesus. Breathe on that room. Breathe on that body. God, we're lifting up an uncle who has leukemia, praying for just complete healing, Jesus, protection of another's mental health as they're suffering, Jesus. Move powerfully, God. Move powerfully. We're lifting up a child, Jesus, who, with so many medical needs. God, we're praying for a miracle, Jesus, a miracle, Lord. And we're praying for a woman in an abusive relationship. We're praying for safety, Jesus. We're praying for safety. God, we know that it is in your name that we can pray. You hear our prayers. This isn't just something we do. Lord, it is, an, it is an action in the natural to see movement in the supernatural, Lord. We love you. We love you in your mighty name and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. Make some noise, y'all. Make some noise. 
Make some noise for these homies who came down to the front, okay? This is how it's done. This is how it's meant to be. We love it. It's beautiful. On the other side of prayer is praise. This morning we are we are praising. Someone had a wonderful weekend with some friends, new friends that they've had at Takeover. Yes, which is exciting. And they're going to see their friend, their son and his family to celebrate Christmas today. And that's beautiful. We love it. We love it. Um, this says, yesterday I had a beautiful time with the Lord. Um, tears, lots of tears, which led to praying over my roommates. Later in the day, the Lord restored a relationship I had with a former roommate that I hadn't spoken to in five years. Wow. God is good. God is good. Um, if we could all just extend a hand towards the... Uh, the leader of the house here, he's over in the dark, fooling around with, with his iPad. Um, his birthday is tomorrow. <laughs> Happy birthday, baby. He will only be 32 years old, which is remarkable because um, he's 42. He, oh, he, you wrote 32, guy. If you want me to read it, you got to write it on there. So just extend your hand towards him, and we're just going to pray a, a birthday blessing over him. Jesus, thank you so much for Matthew. God, thank you so much for the calling that's been on his life since just the very beginning. Thank you for what you've led him through. Thank you for how you've grown him, God. Thank you, Jesus, that he is the leader of this house and that he has bled on every square inch of this church, Jesus. And every single person here, he's bathed in his prayers and in his tears. God, I pray for an incredible year. I pray for you to move so powerfully to bless him and heal the parts of him still hurting. He's not the man he was, and in the end, he's going to be a completely new creation. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Amen. Make some noise, y'all. Ah, thanks, guys. Um, Someone else is praising God that they were kept safe um, in an accident this week, earlier this week, and also another baby boy for takeover. Okay, the first person to have a baby girl, I swear to you, I will give you 100 bucks. It's all boys so far, fam. And when I was talking to Matt yesterday, and I think that just the Lord is telling us we need to raise up a new generation of men. Yes, of manly men, full of faith. That's what God is doing in this place. There are a couple of phrases I didn't get to read this morning, um, but I will share those on our family page. Um, if I can have the Stevens and Miss Angie and the Vander Cody's come up on the stage, y'all can have a seat. We are, we're just going to do a, just a time of introduction and, and, and honoring this morning. If you don't know, uh, Nikki and Charlie, who are making their way up to the stage, they have been serving faithfully in our kids' ministry uh, for some time Come on, time yeah, now. give it up for Nikki and yes, Charlie. Come, come on, on. Come on. Holding it down, building up the youth. Let's go. Yes. And come on. We are so grateful for them. We are so grateful. Come on over here, guys. Um, just to say that, that being in ministry is wild. Being in leadership is just a crazy thing. And there are times where you've got to step back take some time for your family, for your marriage, to raise your kids. And that is what Nikki and Charlie are doing. We are blessing them and honoring them as they are transitioning yes. out of a role of leadership and into a time of focus for their family, their marriage. Yeah, we can make some noise come for that. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is a high calling to be a mother and a father and raise up two godly boys in 2023. Amen. So we celebrate this. We honor this. And truth be told, Takeover Church wouldn't be what it is yes, today exactly. without all you've given yes. all the time. I mean, Charlie, with his own hands, built this very stage yes, that we did. stand yes, on. Yes, he did. So, I mean, can we just honor them? Thank We're honors you. due. Come Thank on. Thank you. Jesus, we thank you so much for the Vander Cody's. Father God, we just pray in your mighty name, Lord, that you would continue to establish them, that you would continue to bless them, God, that this is only the beginning yes, of, of a beautiful, beautiful yes, testimony, Jesus. God, that will only grow. God, I pray that you would protect them and keep them, that your face would shine upon them, that you would bless them in all that they do, Lord, and let them know, fill their hearts, God, that we honor them and that we are so, so overpouring with love over the both of them, Jesus. We thank you for them. 
in your mighty name. We pray. Amen. 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 Let's make some noise. Nikki Let's make Charlie. some noise. Make sure today that you speak to them. If they've had a hand in your children's life and their faith, make sure you get some time with them. Love on them. They're still here. They're still sticking around. They're still going to be part of church. They are just going to be amazing parents in this yes. next season. And it's something worthy of celebration. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Woo! I don't know what that was, but the heavens are rumbling for this. Come on. On the other side of transition is out is transition in. And we've got the Stevens here, who, if you don't know, if you haven't come to the prayer room in the morning, they are leading that up and they yes. are killing it. They are our prayer yes. room leaders. It's amazing. Come on. And we have Angie, and she is just a steadfast, prophetic visionary, Come and on. we love her so much. Yes, yes. So at Takeover Church, it's not just on Matt and I. We spread the leadership out. We've got all these pillars that are strengthening our base here at Takeover, and these these three people are coming in to help and continue to strengthen that. Yes. So we're gonna pray over them. Amen. And welcome them to the team. Absolutely. You're looking at me like I have something to say. No, I don't. I'm just, I we're don't. Doing the eyebrow thing. It's we're amazing. Doing the eyebrow I'll thing. shake my eyebrows at you. Jesus, thank you so much, Father yes, God, God. for Grant, for Sid, for Angie, Lord, for just continuing to grow our team, God, with hearts that are absolutely on fire for you, Lord. I pray a special blessing over every single one of them. I pray a blessing on their leadership, their ministry, God, their testimony, those that they would mentor and bring under their wings, God. I just pray for more wisdom from you, Lord. God, thank you for their hunger. Thank you for their hearts so willing to serve, Jesus. I pray that you would bless them and keep them and that your face would shine upon them forever and ever and always in your mighty name we pray amen 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 come on guys come on this is worthy of celebration real quick here at takeover church we don't uh we don't say staff we have a core because if you want a strong body what's the first thing you got to do you got to have a strong core and these three are coming on our core team so if you need anything or you have any complaints about me you can message there you them go. there you go at that Stevens sounds right and angie at takeovertr.com but no truly guys i just want to say before god before man we love you. We're so grateful for everything that you're about to bring in 2023. And for Nikki and Charlie, we love you guys so much. We love your boys so much. We honor you for everything you've done up until this point. And we are with you till the end of the line, kids. We love you so much. Can we give it up for them one more time? Come on. Yeah, good. I love weird transitions. That's nice. Um, I'm, uh, I'm glad that Matt uh, mentioned sending your complaints about him to them because I'm tired of getting them. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, if, if we haven't met, I'm Pastor Scott. I'm one of the associate pastors here. Um, super happy that you're here. I'm just going to give us a word around our offering real quick, and then um, you know we can get into the, the message and everything here. Um, but when in January, I know that at the beginning of service, um, Pastor Evan highlighted that we are doing our, our first fruits offering um, for the month of January. Um, and am I supposed to dismiss kids right now? Oh, okay. Oh, they're going. All right. Um, all right, kids, get out of here then, all right? Um, but anyway, so Pastor Evan highlighted our, our first fruits offering. Um, and you know, as I was thinking about what I was going to say uh, this morning about offering, we've highlighted the financial side of First Fruits a lot, um, and I kind of want to go a different direction because um, obviously, as he said, financially, we're going to try to give the, the first above and beyond what our normal tithes are this month to set our church up. Um, but shameless plug here, this church doesn't run without people serving in all a bunch of areas here all right so i just want to talk about serving the the body as, as part of our first fruits as well i'm um, just coming out of first peter uh, chapter 4 um, starting in um, verse 8 it just says above all keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude a multitude of sins show hospitality to one another without grumbling as each has received a gift use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. 
Amen. And there, there are seasons in, in church. There are seasons of abundance when it comes to people serving, and there are seasons of few people serving. And if we're being honest right now, we're in kind of a season where we've got few people that are, that are pulling the, the boat here, okay? So um, my encouragement, my, my challenge to, you know, if you call TakeOver home, that this would be something that you really, really pray about. What is an area that I could potentially be honoring the, the Lord and honoring my family at this church um, and just giving a little bit more? We talk about the first fruits where financially we're giving a little bit more where we're uncomfortable, where we're giving above and beyond what we normally give. Um, I would just ask you to pray about serving. What's something, a little bit of your time that you could potentially be giving back to the Lord to where it makes you a little uncomfortable, okay? Like that's, that's where, um, you know, one thing that I've learned about myself is that I really enjoy comfort. I really like the things that make me feel comfortable and, and you know, I have to constantly fight against that and try to be expanding myself so that I'm not just, you know, seeking out the, the easy, comfortable thing all the time. So that, that's just my, my challenge is, what's an area that you may be gifted in that you can just pour back on the Lord? I mean, as, as we just highlighted, you know, Nikki and Charlie are, are going to be transitioning out of doing kids. If you feel like you've been called to, to help with kids ministry, now is the perfect opportunity to come in and, and, and you know, just a fresh face in, in our kids' ministry to help these, this next generation grow up as they should and follow the ways of the Lord. If you feel like you're, you know, if you're musically inclined, we're always looking for people to help on our worship team. If, if you, I hate saying it this way, if you feel like, you know, I don't have any area that I'm really gifted in, everybody smile at me right now. Just show me your teeth. Except for Zach. Everybody here has great smiles, all right? I'm just kidding. I love you, Zach. You got a great smile, buddy. When you walked in, there were people smiling at you, shaking your hand. And it's just a vital part of who we are is just having people show God's love to those people that walk through the door for the first time. So I would just encourage you, pray about it. Seek the Lord and what he has for you and what is that area that you could potentially be turning back to him and giving him a little bit of your time. All right, does that sound good? Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, I'm just going to pray over um, that and over our actual tithes and offerings today. Um, as always, um, we should have a QR code potentially up here um, where you can scan, um, you know, with your phone. It takes you to our link tree where you can give. Um, there's also a donation um, box attached to the wall back there. Um, just for our normal tithes and offerings, I'm going to pray over that as well. Father God, Thank you so much for the blessings that you have poured out on us and this church family. Thank you for just providing for us financially and continuing to let us do this for you every Sunday. God, we pray that you would take the, the tithes and offerings and the financial giving and you would just honor it and you would bless it and you would, you would take it further than we would ever imagine it be able to go. And you would just bless our community with that money, Lord. And Lord, we pray over our, our takeover family in our hearts and, and God, that you would just lay your hand on us, Lord, and you would show us the areas that we can potentially be giving back our time to you, Father God. God, show us those areas where we might be able to, to help serve your kingdom, Lord. And God, we promise to always give you the honor and the praise and the glory for everything that you bless us with, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Well, thank you, guys. Um, now, if you could make some noise for our very own Pastor Matt as he comes up to give us a word. Thank you, Pastor Scott. <laughs> and while I appreciate the applause, there is only one man of the hour, and his name is Jesus. How about you give it up for Jesus? No, you've made more noise for me. You give it up for King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Jesus. Come on. Welcome to the one church, if you're new, that doesn't glorify man over God, amen? Because I tell church every week, if you're new here, I don't care how much you like me, I care that you love him. Amen? Amen? 
Come on. Well, good morning. Are you glad to have been found in the house of God? Come on, somebody. Man, worship was... <sighs> Whatever, come on. You know what I mean? Like, I just can't. I just can't. He's here. He's, he just keeps coming here. He keeps coming here. He keeps dwelling here. He keeps resting here. And that is the whole point. If you're new with us this morning, I do see some uh, new faces. Hi, Pastor Matt. Great to meet you. Love Jesus more than you like me. Amen. It's a home for him. It's a home for him. I am an insane person. And I believe that's because Jesus, when I met him at 16, he just radically changed my entire life. I was adopted into a family that I've, that I never knew was possible in the natural. I met a father who blew mine out the water. It wasn't a high mark to do that, by the way, but God exceeds every expectation I ever had of him. Friends, this whole thing is unto Lord Jesus, Amen. Oh, man, well, the month of January, yes, we've heard it so often already, and that's just to help give you some vision. We realize if we never talk about it, if we never get it in front of you, we don't be like Moses and write it down, make it plain, bring it down. You may never know what's going on. So every single Wednesday, we are having glory nights. And last Wednesday was shh, all sorts of glory in the house. It's a worship night. We just set it apart for hour, hour, half, hour 45, whatever it is. We just lose our minds before Jesus and don't let the time limit or anything uh, intimidate you. Just come, be here as long as you can, engage with the Lord, and, and, then, and then go about your way. But it is, it is worthy of your time. Amen. And while we're talking about that, and yes, there's the first fruits offering on January 29th, and a part of that is we had a prophetic word given to us at a conference last year that it was funny, the Lord gave him an image of the movie Jaws, so we're still praying about that. But, uh, sharks for Christ, it's going to be our soccer team. Um, <laughs> but no, they just said, we just saw the image where you're going to need a bigger boat. And that's really what we're believing for, is a bigger boat. Not, a, not an actual boat, but a bigger boat, a house, a home, a building, something that has more than just two restrooms and a greater kids area so we can be more effective and impactful for the kingdom of heaven. Amen. We ain't asking for a lot. We meet in a beautiful boot up uh, warehouse right now, okay? We are not, I don't need an LED screen. I just need a place to raise up the next generation, amen? So that's a, that's a part of what our first fruits offering is all about. But truly, when we're talking about glory nights, I, we needed to say this. If you're a man of God in the house, I need you to raise your hand. I love you. I believe in you. We're going to raise up men of God in this house. You can put your hands back down. But what that means is, men of God, if you cannot lead yourself to the feet of Jesus, you will not be able to lead your wife to the feet of Jesus. You will not be able to lead your children to the feet of Jesus. You will not be able to lead a girlfriend to the feet of Jesus. You've got to lead yourself to the feet of Jesus. Amen. And I loved Wednesday, it was powerful, but as I looked around the room, there was a ratio of men to women in the room that I was uncomfortable with. Not because I don't enjoy being around women, I'm uncomfortable because I'm asking myself, where are the men of God? We are in an hour. We're literally, men and women are both being hijacked by the enemy, and the men of God are found on their face before the Lord. We need the men of God to be worshiping men of God, amen? Listen to me, we cannot leave the ministry, the ministry of worship. It's not just this. This, this is not ministry unto the Lord, okay? It, it is, but it isn't. Ministry unto the Lord is what we do when we worship him. We don't need a song for that. We just need to be found at his feet. We need to be singing. We need to be lifting up scripture. We need to be talking to Lord Jesus. That is actual ministry unto God. And if the men of God aren't leading the way, then I'm afraid that we're going to continue to go the way of Sodom and Gomorrah, go the way of Babylon, go the way of Rome. We're going to keep going to all of these places that the men of God aren't found being men of God. And how can you call yourself a man of God if you aren't at the feet of God, if you aren't worshiping at the throne of God? I love women of worship, and maybe that should be its own ministry unto itself, the women of worship. But that can't be that all that we do here. So take it as a, a little bit of a spanking. Take it as a little corrective note, but take it with all the love in my heart because it's not just for you, it's for your family. It's for generations that will come from you. Amen.
All right. So men will see you Wednesday at 7. Anyways. Right now we're in a season of church. Really, it's a, it's a prophetic word for our church, for our region in the church. And listen, we don't just have a, a, a single home vision for the church. We don't just have a single house vision for the church. And I don't mean like church planting necessarily. What I mean is, is that while I may not be pastor over every house in this area, I am a pastor in this region. This house is in this region. It is a room in the kingdom of God. And we honor every other room. We love every other room. We bless every other room. But this room, this home, this house in the kingdom of God has been prophetically called to be the people of which God can burn upon in our region. Amen. Jesus in Luke 12, he says, I came to cast fire upon the earth. I've got a baptism that I am distressed over until it comes, being the Holy Spirit. He is looking for a people that he can burn and that will burn for him and we are that people and we are answering that call and that is what this entire season is about and so we are in a message series that's going to go forever called fire upon the earth amen so who's ready for the word of god who loves their b-i-b-l-e yes there's still a church in the midwest that preaches the b-i-b-l-e it's still the book for me and it's the book for you amen all right, if you're taking notes, the title of my message this morning is The Cross and the Coal. The Cross and the Coal. The Cross and the Coal. And I'm coming out of the book of Mark this morning. If you have your Bibles, it is Mark 8, 27 through 38. If you don't have a Bible, no worries. It'll be on the Big Sky Bible behind us. And can you guys just give it up for our amazing serve crew in the booth holding it down for us? <laughs> And give it up for uh, Miss Angie, if you will, who made the cafe abundantly uh, fast-friendly. Come on. All right, the cross and the coal, Mark 8, 27 through 38. Here we go. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Circea of Philippi. You hear me? And on the way, he asked his disciples, who? Somebody say who. Who? 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 Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who? Who do you say that I am? Of course, Peter answered him. He said, you're the Christ. You are the Christ. Church, I said, he is the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and he began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And the calling to the crowd, and him and his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let them deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels, and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words... In this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. We're going to pray and we're going to break that down. Sound good? Fantastic. Father God, oh, Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for this morning, God. We thank you for the Vander Cody's and all of their sowing, God. And we pray, we pray a just amazing harvest in this next season, God, that we just see such a reaping in their lives, God, reaping in love in their marriage, reaping of love with their boys and their family, God. I just thank you, Lord, that this is just a transition to a next season, God, and you are still the Lord of that season, and there's still territory to take. There are still devils to kick. There are still disciples to make. Father, we just thank them. And God, right now, Lord, I just ask that you would just begin a work in this room, Lord. That you would begin to raise up the next generation of our kids' ministry, Lord. To lead the next generation, Lord. To, to really just baptize them in the Holy Spirit. To see them raised up in Scripture. God, planted in the Word, but ran by the Spirit, Lord. And Father, right now, for every person in this room, under the sound of my, under the sound of my voice, God, I just ask 
Holy Spirit, begin a work. Begin such a work, God, that we are burning for you, God. That this morning, Lord, if we came in lukewarm, God, we would be boiling over, God. If we came cold and dry, God, we would come in just running, running after you, Lord. That this morning, that song that we sang, your, your spirit, Lord, your, your water-like spirit to our soul, Lord. That the woman at the well, same situation, Lord. That we would just have such a revelation of who you are as the Christ, Lord. That we couldn't stay dry, that we couldn't stay cold, that we would be burning and running over for you. So Holy Spirit, we just get out of the way. And we say, Holy Spirit, come, have your way. Do a great work in us. We love you, we love you, we love you. In Jesus' mighty and precious and most holy name, a church said, amen. amen. Oh. Oh, I just... I, I don't know why I'm emotional already, probably because the Lord is in the room, but oh, it's my birthday tomorrow. Yeah. Save the applause for when I die and I died faithfully with Jesus, okay? Because I'm just so wrecked. When everyone came and snuck up on me with prayer, I just, I just, I'm so burdened with, I just want to, I just want to run the duration with Jesus. I just want to finish well. I just want to, I don't want to be a statistic of a Christian who deconstructed. I don't want to be a statistic that's all too familiar of, of pastors who are stepping out on their wives and being stupid. I don't want to be another number or another headline in a newspaper outside of there is a revival in the Midwest. Amen. Come on, does anybody want to go the duration with Jesus this morning? I want to go the duration with Jesus. 32 is going to be great. We're going to have a lot of fun here. But it is all into one chief end. That is the glory of Jesus. Amen? Come on. That's pour us out, Lord. That's all I'm here in heaven say right now is I just want a people that I can pour out. I want a people that I can pour out in the Midwest. I want a people that I can pour out in this region. I want a people that I can break, that I can burden, and that I can burn upon. Amen? In the Midwest. Will we answer the call? Amen. There's like six of us that are willing to do that, but I appreciate the six. Jesus did it with 12. I can do it with six. We got this. But no, seriously, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being a part of this church. Thank you for being the crazy people in the Midwest who are truly, truly hungry to see the things of God burn again in the earth. Amen. It's the cross and the coal. You know, Right now we're in this season where the Lord just keeps showing up in our midst. And we, we talk about this every week because we just, uh, partly I, I can't believe it. And, 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 and it's just so amazing what he's doing in this room and in this church. It's so unique that God has a heart to do what he does in this room in every house, but not every house has a heart in it to do what the Lord is doing in this room. Amen. But he always has a heart for it. His heart is always for revival. His heart is always for redemption. His heart is always for resuscitation and resurrection. He is always looking to breathe upon a people, set them ablaze. The problem is there's not always a people that have made themselves available for the burning, but we have. So this can't go understated. This can't go underappreciated because if this goes understated in this home, friends, it will go, I'm trying to look for the correct grammar here. It will go under revelatory in us. Make it work. You know what I mean? It'll go under revealed in us. If we understate this, we will not grasp the full weight and gravity of the revelation of Jesus Christ that is being birthed in this room. That's being birthed in this church. What he is doing in our midst, guys, if we just decide not to celebrate, if we decide not to talk about it, if we just become benign to the fact that, man, we got great worship, we have mediocre preaching, but the Lord keeps showing up. If we just become benign to this, Friends, do we really think Jesus is going to keep falling in the room the way he is? Do we think he's going to keep dwelling in the room the way he is? Do we think he's going to continue to find this home that he can rest in, or is he only going to have weekend visitations? Who do you want to be? What kind of church do you want to be? 
Do we want to be Jesus' number one desire in the earth, fire upon it? Do we want to be the burning ones? Do we want to be burnable people? Or do we just want to join in the clanging of symbols of the religious? Do we just want to be people who gather around the name of Jesus, but we don't have any fruit of Jesus? Do we want to gather around the word of God, but not leave on fire by the word of God? I'm not preaching to anybody this morning. Like right now, we're, we, we, we are a people set apart in the earth because we don't need a New Year's resolution to get God's best. We don't need the calendar to flip over to get God's best, amen? No, 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 his mercies are new every morning for us. That means the burning can be renewed every morning on us, amen? And that means that 2023 is just another opportunity to wake up and run the race that God has set before us faithfully. Okay, mediocre Christianity isn't going to take us where the Lord is at. Amen? Come on. Mediocre Christianity is not going to take us to where Jesus is at. Cultural Christianity cannot carry us where he dwells. The places that he is sitting and that he is resting and that miracles are following. Finally again, the miracles in America are following the saints. It's happening here. But cultural Christianity, 20 bucks on a Sunday, five-part series on how to have a great business, it isn't going to take us where Jesus is heading. Because he's looking for a bride that's fit for a king. He is dressing up a bride that will be blameless, that she will be blemishless, that she will be beautiful, dressed in white, amen, ready with her oil for her bridegroom to return. Who do you want to be? What kind of marriage do you want to have? What kind of purity do you want to be possessed by? What kind of morals do you want to exist by? What kind of honor do you want to have on your home? What kind of single man or single woman do you want to be? Are we going to set ourselves up this year to be a people, a generation in our region that God can trust, that God can burn on, that God can burn in, and that God can burn through? Or do we want to join with so many other movements that started off with a flash, a bang, and a fickle and sizzled out? Who do we want to be? I know pastors don't really get honest like this a whole lot, but friends, have you ever thought about your life? Have you thought about your life? Have you thought about your job? Have you thought about how much you're paid? Have you thought about how many hours that pay gets you? Have you thought about what you are actually giving your life for? You have one go-round on this earth that God has entrusted you with it. And know what I've done? I've given it to build his bride, to save the lost, to make him a place in the earth where he can dwell. And I got to tell you, round of the corner, it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth the heartaches. It's worth the bruises. It's worth the bent and broken relationships. It's worth the gossip. It's worth the glory. It's worth everything that he does because he is finding himself here. And so truly, while we're in a series talking about fire upon the earth, we need to get this in perspective. We need to look at this and we need to get real and honest with Jesus and we need to ask him, burn on us. Burn on us us because you've got one life you've only got so many hours so many breaths so many opportunities so many things and it's silly we start hearing things like this and we start thinking of all the places we haven't gone all the things we haven't seen and well yes the earth should be something that we explore and memories should be made and adventures should be had but friends if there's something above memories made if there's something above adventures had if there's something that should take our breaths away if there's sights that should be seen friends on the top of that list second to none sharing no inch on his throne should be lord jesus yeah. amen I say all of that 
because there is an actual opportunity here. There's an actual opportunity here to answer Jesus' desire. How often do humans get to meet a desire of God's? Think about it. Completely holy, set apart, perfect, has no need for anything because he is secure unto himself. But he has a desire to dwell in the earth, to burn upon the earth, to have a bride in the earth, to return for that bride who is blameless, who is precious in his sight, who has been made white as snow, redeemed, and is walking out her beautiful calling in the earth. You and I, we can do that. We can do that. But you know what it's going to take? It's going to take actually submitting our lives, this one go around, submitting our lives to the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Amen? See, I love this portion of Scripture. I do. I love, well, I love the whole Bible because I'm a Christian, uh, first and foremost, right? There's not a part that I dislike. There's not a part that you know, might dislike some things in me that I got to continue to submit to him. But I love my B-I-B-L-E, amen? Because we're Christians. Someone shouting me out back there. They love their Bible too. Come on. Little tykes should bring out a kid's Bible. <laughs> bring those back. One person knows what that car is. One person remembers. Anyways, it's a little red and yellow mustard car that you push around. Anyways. So here's Jesus. Jesus in this moment, he is with his disciples and they are walking through the streets of Philippi. Now, which is interesting, right? Because actually here is really kind of the beginning remnant, the beginning fire of what would become the church of Philippi, which would often receive letters from whom? The apostle Paul, which then we have the book of what? Philippians. Okay, so you know the book of Philippians? Here's the inception. It's Jesus and his ministry with his boys. They are walking through the streets of Philippi, doing ministry, casting out demons, lifting the heads of the weary, setting people free from oppression, healing them. All sorts of crazy stuff is happening, because why? Crazy things happen when Jesus is in the room. Always. Always. And what happens in this moment it's Jesus, he's with his disciples, and he's getting ready to ask them a question, but this question is off the backside of the fact that they are walking through the city after doing ministry, and word is getting around about Jesus. In fact, the word is spreading like wildfire about Jesus. And we need to pause right there because context is king. And friends, let me tell you this. If the word about Jesus is not spreading like wildfire, then the bride is not burning for Lord Jesus. Hear me today. I don't care how much we sing, set me on fire. I don't care how many services we have about fire upon the earth. I don't care how much I scream into a microphone, how much I try to rally you up, how much we try to do this thing and ignite something. If the bride refuses to burn, the good news doesn't spread like wildfire. But it should. Because everywhere Jesus went, every town he visited, every ministry moment he had, what happened? Crowds grew, even in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit fell. And what? Tongues of fire. He added to their numbers daily. Why? Because the news about who Jesus is spreads like wildfire. And if it's not spreading like wildfire, maybe we don't have the tongues of fire we claim to. It's a problem. It's a big problem. We have to be completely abandoned to this. The disciples were, and guess what the Lord did? Everything in their midst. He held nothing back. He reserved nothing unto himself. He was like, you want all of me? I want all of you. Here's all of me. And he showed up and he showed out and he showed off every single time that Jesus was in the midst of people. Every time. This is who Jesus is. This is how his word should be spread. This is how he should be talked about. But the thing about a people on fire, the thing about the word of God spreading like wildfire, 
is that Jesus has got to burn within you if he's ever going to burn through you. Hear me today. They're making their way through the streets of Philippi. And I love this moment because Jesus, he, you ever been in prayer and God asks you a question? <laughs> Why asking? You already know. <laughs> it's because he wants to co-labor. It's a great co-mission. Everything we do with him is to bring us into, be a part of what he is doing. The very fact that a bridegroom is looking for a bride is a clear invitation. You and I, we don't get to ride the bench in this thing. But in fact, we get invited into the craziest thing of all time. The greatest drama ever played out. This is the amazing story that God is writing and he chooses to use you and I in his narrative. Are you kidding me? It's the best news ever. This is the best invitation I've ever received. And so Jesus, he's talking to his disciples and he, he, he pauses and he goes, we're in Philippi. We're walking through the streets, we're healing people, casting out demons, doing all the things. Who do they say that I am? Who do they say that I am? You see, we got to pause right there because you see what Jesus didn't say is just as important as what Jesus did say. He's God. He mixed no words. He's God. He held his tongue. He's God. He let his tongue fly. When Jesus speaks, he's God. There's a reason he chose to say it how he said it. Who do they say that I am? Notice he didn't say, who do they think I am? See, Jesus isn't really interested in our thoughts on Jesus. He's not. Jesus doesn't give a rip about our thoughts on him. He wants to know who we say he is. Why? Because out of the heart, the mouth shall flow. Those are his own words. Jesus doesn't care about the thoughts they have on him. He wants to know who they know him to be here. How many of us, we have so many thoughts all the time, don't we? We have so many thoughts running through our heads. And guess what we don't do with most of them? Birth them. We don't give any, any license to them. We don't give any lenience to them. We have so many thoughts in our heads about ourselves, about our spouse, about our God, about our kids, about whatever. And guess what we don't do? We don't speak them. Why? Because <laughs> we burn everything down with them and not in a good way. So Jesus, he doesn't care what the word on the, on the street as far as thought goes. Jesus is actually asking a deeper question here, and we never stop to investigate this. We never stop to think about this. We never stop to go, no, 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 no. They, they can think I'm weird. They can think this is extreme. They can think this is crazy. They can think I'm a heretic. They can think I'm a religious fanatic. They can think I'm going against Jewish law. They can think whatever they want to think. Who do they know me to be? What are they saying? What is in their hearts about me, friends, what is in the hearts of the people in our region speaks to the amount of work yet to be done. I'm not preaching to anybody this morning. Hear me today. Are we going to live this year on mission? Are we going to live this year on commission? Are we going to live this year burning for Christ? Then we have got to get Christ in some hearts. Because we live in a great place. You can throw a stone right now and you will hit a church. I guarantee it. However, while there are many Christians who have a lot of thoughts on Jesus, there are few Christians that actually know Jesus. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? Are you someone that has a lot of thoughts on Jesus? Or are you someone that actually knows Jesus? It's out of your heart that the mouth shall speak. Who do we know him to be? Not who can we theologically argue him to be, we got a lot of those, a couple seminaries in the area, a lot of Bible colleges and universities. We have got a lot of thoughts on Jesus, but where are the ones that know him? That's what we're looking for. Because it's clear, they could go through the streets, they could perform miracles, they could set people free, and there could be a lot of thoughts. But few in Philippi that actually know him. Friends, 
the depth of our revelation of who Christ is in our hearts. It determines the amount of work still yet to be done in our region, in our homes, and in ourselves. Who do we know Christ to be? Who does our region know Christ to be? Too many thoughts and too few of knowing. I'm giving my life to the knowing. I'm giving my marriage to the knowing. We're giving our finances to the knowing. We're giving our first fruits, fast season, going without, eating once a day, being hangry and growing in self-control, giving it all over unto what goal? Smaller waistline? No. Vanity? No. Healthier lifestyle? No. It's all for the knowing. It is all for the knowing. And so Jesus, he's actually taking a temperature. He's actually checking the temperature of the amount of revelation in Philippi at this moment. Who do they say that I am? And some, they go, well, these guys are saying you're your cousin John the Baptist. Clearly they haven't met him yet because he is wild and he smells like funk. <laughs> we got to bring that word back. You know what I'm saying? It smells like funk. And they're like, yeah, and the other people, they got it in their head that like maybe you're Elijah, like somehow you just came back down and, and, and the whole thing, they think you're Elijah. And then Jesus, he's probably, he's probably pretty entertained by this because he's like, all right, that's my cousin. He was preparing the way. I am the way, you know what I'm saying? And then there's Elijah and Elijah was like sad and angels had to give him cake. Like he's, he's just, he's laughing at this because he's God. But what he does in this moment is he, he turns the gun. He takes the focal point off the crowd, off the people, off the ministry, off the work. And he puts it on the saints. He puts it on his disciples. He puts it on his chosen few. And he goes, who? Who do you say that I am? See, friends, the, the, the ministry, the ministry of, uh, of, of Takeover Church, the ministry of your life, the ministry of your marriage, of your single season, your, mi your ministry in this earth, it's not going to amount to a whole lot if your depth of revelation of Jesus matches the depth of the people you're trying to reach. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Who's offended? Someone great in church made me a custom notebook that says who's offended on the back of it because she knows I say it so much. Hilarious. I feel so seen. <sighs> Friends, who... Who do you say that I am? See, this isn't the three years mark yet. This isn't where he's about to go. Jesus has actually only been with his disciples for like a year and a half to almost two years at this point. And, but how many of you know, like, at least this is how it should go, uh, two years with Jesus. That's two years with the God of the universe where every word that departs from his mouth has the ability to curse fig trees and birth planets and solar systems. I mean, you should be astounded at two years into your relationship with Jesus. Problem is, we've had too much self-help Christianity. Jesus didn't have any of that. He's like, I'm Savior, let me help you. I'm not interested in you cleaning yourself up, let me wash your feet. That's who he is, right? That's what he does. I don't need self-help Christianity, I want Savior redemption Christianity. Don't tell me about me, I don't need to know how, how I work better, I need to know how he works better. Amen? I don't need a deeper revelation of myself. I need a deeper revelation of Jesus. I don't need a deeper revelation of the human condition. I need a deeper revelation of who he is and what he is doing in the earth. Let me take on his blood and get rid of mine. Put me on an IV to heaven. Maybe we'll remix Roots Above and Branches Below for us sometime. Fun, fun series. You go back and listen to it. It's crazy. There was 15 people in a basement <laughs> preaching about Roots running up to heaven because we've always been crazy. And we just always believe the Bible. But that's what he's doing. He turns it on his disciples. And what I find interesting here is that it's Peter that answers. But you know what? Peter, who always shouts his mouth off, and in a moment he's going to, he's going to step in it big time in just a moment. And it's, it's funny to watch because I do it all the time. <laughs> but, here's, but here's Peter. 
who at the same time is flamboyant, outrageous, and offensive, but is also faithful, consistent, hardworking, puts his hand to the plow and just gets after it. I mean, he is the biggest walking contradiction, which is probably why everyone says, I remind them <laughs> of Peter, just trying to get it as a compliment. But there's a reason that Jesus says to him later on, hey, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's, because, it's not because he is the rock, the revelation. It's because he has the rock, the revelation. And he spouts it off in this moment. He says, Jesus, you're the Christ. No, no, no. You and I, we're in West Michigan in 2023. We do not understand what, what Peter just confessed. We don't get it. We don't get it because we're not as close to it. 5,000 years of human history, this was 2,000 years ago of them, 3,000 up until that point. And for 3,000 years, Jewish boys and Jewish girls were raised in the temple being told about a Christ, a Messiah that would come and save everything. A people that were actually oppressed, a people that were owned by Egyptians, a people that were being dumb in the desert when they were free, people that came from Abraham, a people that were found in their genealogy back to the garden. This is what they were raised on. This is what they've known. They have been told from the crib there is a Christ. This wasn't just a church in a region that was influential. This was a truth in the earth at the time. There's a Christ. He is Savior. He is Messiah. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is the one who is, the one who was, and the one who will always be. There is a Christ. And so you and I, we, we, have, the, we have the luxury. Our revelation of who Jesus is is a luxury. I say that because it cost us little to nothing to hold that revelation in 2023. But for Peter, these disciples, these Jewish men and women following Jesus, it cost everything. It cost everything to make the confession, to have the deep revelation in their heart. He's the Christ. We have the luxury it was a necessity. It was a broken. It was a burden. It was a burning. It was burning in them and burning through them and burning upon them. That Jesus, no doubt, is the Christ. See, we, we have the ignorance in 2023 of Christ being his last name. Mary's last name wasn't Christ and neither was Joseph's. Christ is a title. Christ is a title. Christ is a mantle. Christ is his birthright. Christ is his crown. Christ is his throne. Christ is his position. Christ is who he is. And so for these boys, these men, these women, these disciples, it cost them everything to hold this revelation while it cost you and I almost nothing in America in 2023. That's why I call it the cross and the coal, because we'll get to the cross in a moment. But friends, if Christianity hasn't cost you anything yet, you're not taking Jesus up on everything he's paid for. Who do you say that I am? You're the Christ. Without hesitation, the Christ. Friends, today I, I, I think that we are just in deep need. The church is in deep need we are underwater, holding our heads up, treading in this religious, traditional thing that we have made called seeker Christianity for the last 30 years. But I am telling you, there is a time when the remnant bride will be blameless, beautiful, and white, dazzling in her dress. And there might be few of them, but she will be pure, and she will have the deep revelation that costs her everything to know that he's the Christ. Peter doesn't just think he's the Christ. Peter doesn't just have thoughts that, well, maybe he could be. You're such and such. Well, maybe. No, Peter, Peter understands what this would cost him to say it. 
Peter understands what it means to confess this. Peter knows what it means to have a revelation that he is standing next to, being fed by, his feet are being washed by, he is doing life with and sleeping next to the Christ. I pray that we get this revelation because friends, the cost will come, the bill will come due, the toll will be paid, and guess what? It'll be worth everything it costs you because to hold the revelation that Jesus is who he says he is, it's worth everything. Just that revelation alone is worth everything, but if you need me to sweeten that for you, it's honey on our lips, sweeten that for you, if Jesus is the Christ, if he is who he says he is, and if he's accomplished all that he says he's accomplished, that means you are who he says you are. Come on, come on. Do I know how I know that? Because Jesus calls Peter Satan for thinking anything different. See, in this next moment, the crowd starts coming again. Because in the first part, he says he's with his disciples, and they're walking, and they're talking, and they're doing this whole thing. And then he says to his disciples, starts preaching, and the crowd around them. That means people started hearing again because the word of Jesus was getting out. Even in a circle, the word of Jesus was going forth. I mean, in our churches, if we're going to be found on our phone, we either be taking notes on our Dwell app or you version, or we need to be texting somebody, you need to join me here next Sunday. The word of God should always be going forth. Amen? So this is happening, and Jesus, he starts talking about what the Christ actually means and what the Christ will actually accomplish, what the Christ will actually do. And he's going, man, I'm going to be betrayed. The Son of Man, the Son of God, he is going to be betrayed. He's going to be handed over, and it's going to be by the teachers, by the preachers, by the rabbis, by the scribes. It's going to be by all the people who have taught about me, prophesied about me, proclaimed me, and they are going to be the very ones that hang me. So again, these Jewish boys and girls, they're going, wait. And this, is why, this is why Peter has a hard time believing it. Because friends, you can have a depth of revelation about Jesus, but not have the depth of revelation about Jesus that Jesus has. Do you hear me today? Listen to me. Because what is about to happen next will change us. But we need to get this thing down. Christ's chief concern for you and me, the bride in this hour, is that we would get a revelation of who he says he is that he holds of himself. Listen, listen, we have, got, we have gotten obscured. We have got a West Michigan. We have got a seeker friendly. We have got a Pentecostal or a Reformed or whatever it is. And all of them have great things. All of them have bad things. But all of them fall short of his own revelation of who he is. I love doctrine, I love theology, and the only time I'm gonna have perfect doctrine or perfect theology is when I'm in heaven, and I will give my life to possessing it because I want, I want the revelation in my heart of who Jesus is to match the revelation in Jesus' heart for who Jesus is. Do you hear me? If Jesus, if, if, if out of the mouth the heart shall flow, that doesn't just apply to you and me. That applies to Jesus. That applies to God. That applies to the Holy Spirit. Do you know what that means? That means in the heart of God is Jesus. In the heart of God, who Jesus says he is, is found in the heart of God. Peter, he goes to rebuke Jesus. He takes him aside calls him the Christ, knows what it will cost him, finds out what the Christ actually means in that moment. His mind is blown, and he rebukes the Christ all in the same two minutes of time. Now, if that isn't the history of the human condition, I don't know what it is. But do you know what Jesus does at this moment? He rebukes Peter back, and he says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Just like that. Just like every southern bell in the Bible bell. Get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus puts Peter on blast for having a shallower revelation 
of who Jesus is than what Jesus actually possesses of himself. But the backside of that is actually an invitation into sharing in the same revelation. You see, right now we, we've got a revelation that's good. It's dang good because he is liking it, because he is showing up in our midst and he is doing things when we're not even asking him to do it. People are getting healed without us even saying prayers. It's just because they're here. It's because they're in the presence. It's because they're soaking and abiding in his word and in his place and in his people. It's amazing what he's doing in our midst. I said it's amazing what he's doing in our midst. It's a privilege. It's an honor. It doesn't happen the same way everywhere. So we've got a good revelation But is it Jesus' revelation? Because I know there's still some times where I tell him, oh, Jesus, I can't do that. Jesus, I can't forgive my dad. I can't have that conversation. Jesus, I can't preach that message. Jesus, I can't meet up with that person. Put it on yourself, whatever it is. Jesus, I can't, I can't forgive them. I can't make that phone call. I can't lay hands on that person. I can't pray for them. My boss, whom I hate, broke their leg, and they have made my life a living hell up until this point. You're telling me to lay hands on their leg and it will be healed? No, I want them to suffer. Like, we have these moments, right? Yes. Talk about it. Yes. Man, we can't fix something if you don't know it's broken, y'all. We have those moments where Jesus is saying, no, I am who I say I am. You are who you say you are. I can do what I say I can do. You can do what I say you can do. You refuse because we have a shallower revelation of himself than whom Jesus has a revelation of himself. You see, he's looking for a generation that will match heartbeats with him. He's looking for a generation that will get on his frequency. He's looking for a generation that's heart will share in the depth of the revelation he has of himself. He's offering that to us. He's offering that to us. And every time we sit there and go, Jesus, I can't. Jesus, you can't. There's no way this is going to happen. There's no way this bill can be paid. There's no way I can get out of this. There's no way this is going to come to pass. There's no way my dreams are going to happen. No way, no way, no way, no way, no way. And Jesus pulls through. Yahweh. <laughs> the reason Jesus calls Peter Satan in that moment is because when our depth of revelation of who he is doesn't match his depth of revelation of who he is, we bear an image that looks closer to Satan than we do Jesus. <coughs> Argue with me can't because he just said he was the Christ we all do that and then we and then he just told Jesus what he can't do guess what we do that too and it's in those moments of telling Jesus he can't or we won't or that won't happen that we bear an image more closely looking and resembling sounding like Satan himself than we do Jesus himself and it's in that moment friends this is actually good news this is good news We've examined it. We've identified the problem. Here's the good news. You want to know what the good news is? We can stop right there and we can pause and we say, God, I don't want to run out of disbelief. I want you to come and help me with my unbelief. Jesus, would you come in this moment and give me a deeper revelation? If you're saying this can happen, if you're saying this forgiveness needs to flow, if you're saying I can lay hands on them, they'll be healed. If you're saying this can happen, if you're saying this is my calling, Jesus, I don't want to run from you out of fear that you can't and that you won't. No, Lord, I don't want to run in disbelief. I want you to help me with my unbelief. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come into my unbelief and help me, Holy Spirit. Amen? I love this because here's what Jesus says next. This is, this is paramount. This is really where I want to settle in. New people are like, how long is this service? Long enough for you to look a little bit more like Jesus, I promise you. But Jesus, he says something that I think is really passed over and absolutely brilliant, not just because he's the God of the universe, but because as a preacher myself, I really value his wordplay. <laughs> Best rapper ever, Jesus, 100%. Jesus says this. He says next, he says, If anyone should come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. Hear that. Hear that. If anyone should come after me, 
Let him then deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. You see, how we hear that is we don't hear that how Jesus said. One more time for good measure, because we don't get it. If anyone should come after me, let them then deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow me. What we think Jesus just said was, if anyone wants to follow me, deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow me. But that's not what Jesus said. The beginning is not the ending, the ending is not the beginning. In fact, what is actually happening here is the, the ending is the beginning, and the beginning is the ending. You follow my math? Listen, the beginning of that sentence, I know I said the same thing. It was, it was meant to be a joke. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Pity laughs. It's my birthday. Uh, the beginning of the sentence is not the same as the ending of the sentence. And the truth is, is that the ending of the sentence is actually the beginning in the beginning of the sentence is actually the ending. See, God has always been like this. He is what? Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the author and the finisher. This is how always how he's been. And Jesus is just flexing his authorship in this moment. Hear me. He says, listen to the word of Jesus. Red letter, y'all. If anyone should come after me, let them then deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. The phrase, if anyone should come after me, is not synonymous with the phrase, follow me. But we treat it like it is. No, no, no. What Jesus is saying in this moment will blow your mind if you actually read what Jesus said and take it for what Jesus actually said. If anyone should what? Come after me. Well, what does that mean, Pastor Matt? Why the distinction? Jesus. Jesus has always been in, interested in reproducing what? Little Christ's. He's always been interested in multiplying. He's always been introducing, past, uh, Apostle Paul says what? Christ was the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. This is what Jesus is speaking to here. He's not saying, follow me, deny yourself, pick up a cross and follow me. He's saying, no, if anyone should come after me, if there will be a hope in the earth after me, if there will be a fire in the earth after me, if there will be a light in the darkness after me, if there will be little Christ after me, then let them deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow me. Are you hearing me this morning? He's talking about the after me's. Do I have any after me's in the building? No, I'm dead serious. Do I have any after me's in the building? Because our world is a clear need of some after me's. The church is in clear need of some after me's. We got a lot of apathy, not a lot of after me's. Come on, somebody. We have too many apathetic, lethargic, deconstructing and benign to the truth of the gospel Christians. And we are done with apathy. We need after me's. Let's be a people that are getting back to being the after me's. This is what Jesus said. This is why I called it the cross and the coal. It's because there is a moment where we decide, you know what? I'm going to be the one. I am going to follow him. I'm going to put up my cross. I'm going to deny myself. New year, new you. No, 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 no. Alive you, dead you. Amen? Yeah. You have to die. You have to deny yourself. 2023, have a funeral, but don't you dare have a memorial. There is nothing in your old dead life that is worthy of being memorialized. Everything in Christ is worthy of being memorialized. Come on, somebody. Have a funeral. Don't you dare have a memorial. You got to deny yourself if you're going to be everything that Christ paid for. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. The gospel is the after me's. This is what he actually died for, paid for, went to the cross and hell for. It's so that you could deny yourself. Jesus had to die so that you could actually shake off chains and snakes. Did you know that? You, he actually had to die so that you had a, a, a fragrance, a little, a little bit of filament of fire on the inside of you to be able to shake chains loose and be all that God's called you to be. He had to die for that for that small flicker filament of fire on the inside of you. He had to be killed for that. And yet we live Christian lives just scratching the surface of the promise of God. 
deny yourself in 2023. New year, new me. No, no, no. Old me is dead. New me is alive. I'm denying my wants. I'm denying my desires. I'm denying my dreams. Friends, there is a dream for your life that God dreamed up for you in his heart, but it comes with a cross on your back. It comes with a cross on your back. We don't like hearing that language. We probably are offended, but God's dream for you is bigger and better and badder for the gates of hell than your dream for you, than for your marriage, than for your purity, than for your singleness, than for your integrity, than for our region, and then for our country. But it comes lock stock with two pieces of wood slapped on your back. Friends, you will never do, you will never see, you will never enter into and live the dream that God has for you. He dreamed you up in heaven. You're not here on accident. Circumstances that brought you in the world may not be awesome circumstances. Things may have happened in the home that you were raised in, mine too. Terrible things may have happened in your inception but God has always had you in his mind and his dream for you blows everything you've gone through out the water. There is beauty for ashes and there is joy for your pain and it eclipses it all. But friends, it comes with a cross on your back. But Jesus says, this is the only way you can live the after me life. The only way you can live the after me if there's going to be a bride in the earth to point to a relationship with God in heaven, let her deny herself, pick up her cross, and follow. Are you hearing me? Are you getting the revelation of the after me? This leads me to the coal. So there's a prophet, Isaiah. And Isaiah... He's an amazing prophet of God, and he had some of the hardest tasks of any prophet of God. But while he may have been a before Jesus, he certainly had the after me kind of spirit. Because hear me, what he did actually paved the way before John the Baptist. It was Isaiah being a wild banshee for the call of God in the earth. And all of the verses that we quote at Christmas time, all of Isaiah 53, 5 that we quote about Jesus and his stripes and all the things that talk about his healing, all of the prophecies about how Jesus has to fulfill this, fulfill this, fulfill this, if he's to be the Christ, all of those things. Man, you bust open the book of Isaiah and you're going to see just how impossible it was for Jesus to be who Jesus is and yet completely undeniable that Jesus is who Jesus says he is. But it's in the book of Isaiah that you see all of this play out. It's by his stripes that we are healed. He is bruised for our transgressions, a pierced for our decree, but it's by his stripes, right? He is the Christ. But in Isaiah 6, 6 through 8, there's an amazing thing happening. And if you've ever spent any time in cultural Christianity or at a Christian bookstore or at a seeker-friendly church or Christian daycare, you probably see this on a lot of bumper stickers. <laughs> But it's Isaiah 6, 8, and he says, here I am, Lord, send me. But I want to read the verse just briefly right here. Are you ready? You love your Bible? You got more room for the Bible? Here we go. Isaiah 6, 6 through 8. And then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar, the altar of God in heaven. Hear me. With a pair of tongs, he touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. This is Isaiah talking. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go before us? See, God is talking about who will go before, and Jesus is talking about who will come after. Hear me. This is for us the cross, and the coal. Because Isaiah answers God back, who will go before us? He goes, here I am, Lord, send me. Now, most Christians, we stop reading that, uh, that chapter right there because it's awesome. 
We get the warm fuzzies. We're like, here I am, Lord, send me. And we write like great Christian hit songs on it that are perfectly timed to fit on their Christian radio between soccer practices. Like we, we kill that verse, don't we? We make that thing awesome. We got it on bumper stickers and t-shirts everywhere. Here I am, Lord, send me. Problem is, we stop reading right there because if we actually understood the depth of this verse, we would understand that a lot more of us would shut our mouths and we would quit saying, here I am, Lord, send me, because we would actually be trembling for what comes next unless we were burned by the coal. See, Isaiah, in this moment, he has a moment of burning with the Lord. He's the before me, we are the after me's. But it is all the same call to have a cross and the coal. You see the coal, it comes and it touches his lips. The angel puts it on his lips and it burns him. And it burns him to the point that he gets a taste for the hot. He gets a taste for the burning. He has a taste for the coal. And he is actually able to utter the words, here I am, Lord, send me. But where Isaiah was being sent looks a whole heck of a lot different than where God sends you and me. We're sent to West Michigan. We got lakes, we got breweries, we got coffee shops. Sure, we got to contend with some silly people and a bunch of pagans and heathens, for sure. But otherwise, we got it pretty cush. Because Isaiah, directly following this, God goes, great, glad I have you. You're going to Israel. Awesome for a Jewish guy. Love Israel. And God goes, no, I burned you. If I've burned you, you get an assignment worthy of the burning. You get an assignment. If you get a call from God, you get an assignment worthy of a call from God. And a call from God is never easy. It requires the cross on your back. Because Isaiah has to go to Israel and say, I'm here to bind up every ear. I'm here to deafen every ear. I'm here to blot out every eye. I'm here to blind every person. I am here to cut you off from seeing the Lord, from hearing the Lord. I am here so that this ground can be swallowed up by the glory of God, so much so that only a stump will exist and remain in Israel. And God says, this stump will be a holy seed. Can you imagine your call is going to God's chosen people and saying, this is done. You don't get to disparage him anymore. You don't get to live unworthy lives anymore. No, 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 we are, you, you, your ears are now going to be deaf. Your eyes are now going to be shut. Your land is going to be shriveled up and dry, and there is only going to be one stump in Israel that will be a holy seed for what God will do when he returns. See, we stop reading it, here I am, send me. But you got to understand, there is a cost to the coal and there is a cost to the cross. But I guarantee Isaiah being touched by the seraphim. It was the highlight of his life. He got to then go and prophesy to Israel and the world of whom Jesus is. He was entrusted with the secrets of the throne room, all because he was willing to be burned by the coal and wear his cross. Worship team, you can make your way. It was funny, I was praying about this service, and I was praying about this message, and I was praying about this series, and I was praying about the season in church and the prophetic word that God has given us, and I was praying about all of these things, and literally the Lord, this doesn't usually happen, I'm not like a picture guy, the Lord literally gave me a picture of a t-shirt, silly, I don't know if we'll actually make it, but it was a black cross here, and a black burning coal smoldering over here, and it was just the cross and the coal, and I knew when he said that, I knew where we were going in scripture, I knew what it was about, and I knew why he was saying it, and I understood in that moment what he was hoping to accomplish. Because right now there is a deep need, there is a thirst, it is dry, it has been quenched, and right now there is a bride that not only has a back that has been crossless for far too long, but she's not been touched by the coals of the altar of God in some time. 
So just a moment, like we do every service, we're going to finish up with a moment of worship. Last Sunday was anointing Sunday. And maybe it's just a Pentecostal in me, or maybe it's just the urgency of the hour, but I can't not, 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 not have a service end without some sort of altar call moment where we open this up and we just say, if you need to put a cross on your back again, if you're going to live the after me kind of life, if you are going to be God's dream for you, then come find yourself at the altar and you deny yourself, you pick up your cross and you follow him. I also believe that right now we are in deep need of prophets. We got a whole lot of pastors in the bride today and very few prophets. Why? Because prophets are hated, prophets are threatened, Prophets have the responsibility of getting precise words from heaven because it directs countries and nations and peoples and marriages and lives. A lot of weight and a lot of responsibility upon their shoulders to get it right, to keep their hearts conditioned to hear from heaven correctly. And generally it doesn't come with a 1099 or a paycheck attached to it. In fact, rarely are you talked about in the church and barely are you honored. We spend a lot of times making jokes off your back and at your expense. But I believe now is a time for prophets to rise up in our region. Prophets can't only be found in Dallas. Prophets can't only be found in the Bible Belt. Prophets have to be found in the house of God again. And so I need the people. We need the people. The region needs the people whose lips have been touched by the coals of the altar. So I say to you, if you want to grow in the gifts of wisdom, the words of knowledge, begin to prophesy, hear from heaven be committed to this to getting it right and being held accountable to God and man I'm not saying you got to be John the Baptist in a loincloth eating locusts but I'm saying you will live a life that is on display with a cross on your back that will cost you everything if that's you then I also want to open up the altar to you and we're not going to come we're not going to pray over you we're not going to have like this in-depth moment, what I believe the Lord is doing right now, if that's you, a cross on your back or cold to your lips, if that's you, this is between you and Jesus. It's not between you and a pastor. It's not between you and a church leader. This is between you and the creator of the universe. So would you stand? We're going to worship. The altar is open. We love you. But if you want the cross on your back and the coal on your lips, this is your moment. And for the rest of us, let us just end today in worship of Lord Jesus. Father God, I thank you right now. I thank you, God, as we are closing out this moment with you, Lord, that right now, Lord, you are preparing, you are stirring in the hearts. There are people right now who are thinking, could that be me? Yes, it's you. Could I really live a dream worthy of God dying on the cross? Yes, you can. Do I really have the value that he's been screaming about for an hour and seven minutes? Yes, I do. Could I really hear from heaven? Yes, you can. Can I really live this entire life for Jesus set apart unto him? Yes, you can. If that's you, don't wait for me. Just start coming down. This is between you and God. There are Christians with crosses on their backs being tugged in their hearts right now. There are Christians right now whose lips are beginning to feel the sensation of warmth on them again. There are tongues that are beginning to be, begin moving inside of cheeks that are getting a taste for the flame. There are people in this room right now that activation is happening on the inside of you as you are being drawn to the altar. You are being drawn to the altar. If you feel like you're going to look like a fool, I ask you today, whose fool will you be?
Will you be a fool for yourself and your own dignity, or will you be a fool for Christ for all of eternity? Whose fool will you be? Come to the altar. Jesus, take over this moment. Holy Spirit, take over this moment. Take over this very room. Take over our thoughts. Take over our lips. Take over this moment, God. We give it to you wholeheartedly, abandoning all that we are to you in this moment of worship, God. We lay it out. And we say, come, Lord Jesus, come. In Christ's mighty name, worship team, sing and let us worship the Lord. Amen. It was my cross you bore So I can live in the freedom you died for now And now my life is yours And I will sing of your goodness
Jesus. Father God, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you, Lord, for the surgery that has been done today. God, that some of us are, we're gonna leave this place feeling unsettled inside, that, that there have been things that have been pruned and cut away. And God, I just pray that your presence rests on all of your people, Lord, as they, as they seek to heal those parts that you are literally cutting away for their own sake, Jesus. I thank you for what you've done in my own heart. I thank you for what is taking place right now in this room, God. We love you, we honor you, we praise you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you for moving powerfully. Amen, amen, amen. Guys, thank you so much for coming today. We love you, we love you. If you need prayer, don't leave this place without getting prayer, okay? Zach said that as he was praying, as he was seeking, there's someone in the room who needs prayer over their left knee, over their left knee. He's gonna meet you over by that prayer sign. And if that's you, go and receive your healing. That being said, as we continue to drive forward in this first month, giving everything to God, there is a Dwell app that we are, that church is providing for all of you. Take the time, scan the code, get the app for free. Dwell in the law of our God. Yes? It will change you. It will radically, radically change you. Wednesday, we have our glory night, our worship night. Who's going to be there? Come on. Make some noise. Friday morning is prayer, and then Sunday we're back here again. We love you. We are believing and praying with you and over you. And don't leave this place without saying hello, okay? Sound good? Sound good? All right. Amen. We love you. Mwah.